Our Father, we thank you for this time. We bless your name because whenever we come here, you teach us your word and you reveal to us more of your mind, more of your will, and you want us to understand how to do what you want us to do. Father, we're asking today that as we come again to learn from you, you'll teach us your word in truth and reality in Jesus' name. Amen. And Father, we are praying that the word you teach us will lead us along to live a life and to do a work that will be pleasing to you and glorifying to your name. As we get involved in your work, we pray that through us, your church at large will grow up. We ourselves will be rewarded at last. Thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we pray. In our study of Acts of the Apostles, we come to an important area that every church member needs to understand. I want to read to you from Acts of the Apostles, chapter 8, verses 5 through to 8. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 8, verses 5 through to 8. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies, and that were lame, were healed. And there was, there was great joy in that city. Philip was one of the seven spirit-filled men chosen to help in the task of food distribution in the early church. You remember that the church grew and multiplied in number. As a result of that, some area, some part of the work was being neglected, unknown to the apostles leading the church. But eventually the neglect came to the notice of the apostles and they decided by the leading of the Holy Ghost they were going to choose seven men that will take care of that area of need in the church. Seven men were chosen. The first person to be chosen was Stephen. The second was Philip. It tells about that Philip we're studying today. And has given us something that is, contains a wealth of knowledge that the church should be able to learn from. To link you up with his introduction in the church, his link uh, with what we're reading today, and what he started doing in the church. Let me just read to you from Acts chapter 6, from verse 2. Then the twelve called the multitude of disciples unto them and said, It is not reason, meaning it is not reasonable, that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the world. And the saying pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. Of these seven men, we have learned much about Stephen. We have seen his life, we have seen the ministry, we have seen the power, we have seen the miracles that came out of his ministration, we have seen the gift of God in the life of Stephen. We have seen his knowledge of the scriptures, and we have seen how boldly he confronted 
uh, the council in telling them that Jesus Christ is the Christ, the Messiah, who has been sent as propitiation for our sins, as a redeemer to take away the sins of the whole world. Now we come to the second of the seven men, his name Philip. And um, we're told of what happened as he went down to Samaria and he preached the word with much power and effectiveness. I've already read to you from Acts of the Apostles, chapter 8, in verse 5. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria. Now, already you have studied last week with me here that there was persecution in the early church. And as a result of the persecution, the believers were scattered away from Jerusalem. The apostles remained in Jerusalem to continue the propagation of the gospel there. But then the believers were scattered all around the regions of Judea and Samaria. And everywhere they went, everywhere they were scattered, they were preaching the word. I told you last week that you have the word preaching in verse 4 and the word preached in verse 5. I told you there are two separate words, different words. I told you that in the Greek, that the word in verse 4 is galizum. And it means just to share the word, to pass the news around. Just similar to what I was telling you in the Sunday worship yesterday about the great commission for the great congregation. And I told you that it will be necessary as we are sharing the gospel, you notice the message, the motive, and the method. And that as we are sharing it, you are telling your testimony, and you are telling people that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And I told you that is the very core, the very center, uh, the very essence of the gospel, talking about the love of God for the world that is lost in sin and evil. Now, as they were scattered, they were passing the world around like that. They told strangers, they told neighbors, they told friends, they told everybody they had contact with that Jesus Christ is the Savior. But then, I told you last week that the word preach in verse 5 is keruso, and it means to proclaim. And it's different from every believer just sharing the word, talking to the neighbor, talking to the friend, and talking to acquaintances and colleagues in places of work. It's a different thing. It's talking about a proclaimer, a publisher, a preacher, an evangelist. That's the Greek word. And in fact, we're told in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 21, the settled ministry, the established ministry of this man, Philip. Turn with me to Acts chapter 21, verse 8. And the next day, we that were of Paul's company departed and came unto Caesarea, and we entered into the house of Philip the evangelist. Philip the evangelist which was one of the seven and abode with him. Now, you see there that the Bible, the New Testament, labeled and called him Philip the Evangelist. And as he was referred to as the Evangelist, it's very, very important to us because the work and the office of an Evangelist is very important in the church. Very important in the church. And yet, do you know this? There is only one record of only one person that officiated and ministered as a New Testament evangelist. The word evangelist appears three times in the New Testament. Once in Ephesians, once in uh, Second Timothy, and once in the Acts of the Apostles. And there is only one person that we are told of the activities that ushers us and introduces us to the very work and the activities and the ministry and the gift and the talent and the outreach of the evangelist. That is why it's important for the church to study the life and the ministry of Philip the evangelist. Now, let me just uh, show you in the two other passages already I have read to you from Acts chapter 21 verse 8 where it mentions Philip the evangelist. 
Now in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now you find five words here. Very, very important words. Offices in the church. Officers in the church. Gifts that are given to the church. Personalities that build up the church. Five of them. One, apostles. And you see then the plural. Because uh, there were many apostles. Prophets. In the plural. Because there were many prophets. And some evangelists. Plural. Because there were many of them. And some pastors. Many of them. And teachers. Plural. Many of them. Now there were many evangelists in the early church. But then we're given the record of only one of them. We're given the ministry and the outreach. The activities of only one of them. That is why we need to study it so closely. To know. How do we know when we see an evangelist? Who is an evangelist? What does an evangelist do? How does he carry out his ministry? Where does he carry it out? And from what basis, from what foundation does he use as a, as a springboard to launch into the evangelistic ministry? We'll see that. Now in um, 2 Timothy chapter 4. I'm reading there in verse 5. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Verse 5. But watch thou in all things, and dear afflictions, do the work of an evangelist. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. Now, Paul the Apostle was writing to Timothy, a young man. And um, he was telling him to do the work of an evangelist. I'm sure you know this already that Timothy was a teacher, a teacher of the word. Because in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, it says, The things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. And in verse 15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth, needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. He was a teacher of the word. A teacher of the word. And in 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Verse 13. Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. So then he was to teach doctrine. And as a person teaching doctrine, you will see that that is the office of a teacher. He was also a pastor. Because as a pastor, he was over a church. And um, he was told how to relate to members of the church, how to counsel in the church, how to lead people in the church, how to do the shepherding work in the church. Now in 1 Timothy chapter 5, look at verse 1. Rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father, and a younger man as brethren. The elder, the elder women as mothers, the younger uh, as sisters, with all purity. Now you see, he was to counsel, he was to rebuke, he was to uh, commission the, the people, he was to lead the workers, and he was told how to, lead, how to lead and how to direct the young and the old, the men and the women. In chapter 5, verse 19 and verse 20, Against an elder receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses, them that sin rebuke before all, that others, may, that others also may fear. You see, that's the work of a pastor. He was a teacher of the word of God. He was a pastor in the church of God. He was also to do the work of an evangelist. Now, the question is this. What's the difference between a pastor and an evangelist? What's the difference between a pastor and a teacher? What's the difference between an apostle, a prophet, and an evangelist? Because if you do not know the differences, you will not know when you are called to be an evangelist. And what you are supposed to do if you are in the position of an evangelist. I've, I've just shown you that there are many evangelists in the New Testament. 
but then we're given one in particular and uh, some detail is recorded about his life, about his ministry, about uh, the productivity in his ministry. And his ministry is the one that helps us to understand the work of an evangelist, even in the present day. Now before I tell you what the Bible has to say about the evangelist, let's come back to Philip. Philip was a worker in the church. And later he became an evangelist. Now that's very important to us. I want you to see where the name, as the name Philip appears. One, let's see Acts chapter 6 verse 5. And the saint pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip. That's the first mention of that name. They chose that man to be a worker in the church. And now in chapter 8 verse 5. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. You have that name again, Philip. And in Acts chapter 21 verse 8. And the next day, we that were Paul's company departed and came unto Caesarea, and we entered into the house, into the house of Philip the Evangelist, which was one of the seven, and abode with him. As I read those three references to you from chapter 6, from chapter 8, from chapter 21, I want you to see something. That first, he had a lowly work to do, a humble work to do in the church. No doubt he knew that the power of God was upon his life. The spirit of God was upon his life. The anointing, the unction of the Holy Ghost was upon him. In fact, that was the basis upon which he was chosen to be a worker in the church. Look here at men among you. Seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and full of wisdom. It's on that basis that Philip was chosen. And yet... He must have been dreaming about the day the Lord will make him to be an evangelist. He must have been looking forward to the time the Lord will use him in a dynamic way to work as an evangelist. But while looking ahead, while looking forward, while thinking about the future ministry that the Lord will give to him, he was submissive in the church to do the work of a worker. Listen to me. It doesn't pay anybody to be impatient. You will find if the Lord wants to use you. You will find if the Lord is going to put you in a special ministry. That there will be a zeal within. There will be a prompting within. A tendency within. There will be a rising up within. There will be the thing that will be telling you that there is something that is broader and greater and richer and deeper and higher than what you are doing today. But then, as we're looking forward to what is greater and deeper, richer and higher and greater, you want to understand that whatever your hand is finding to do now, you do it with all your strength. That's what Philip did. He had been faithful in the church as a worker. And he never grumbled. He never complained. He was never critical of the leadership of the church. You know, you know not listen to me. Because uh, I have found many, many young people when you are looking into the future as to what you will do, you will find that if you are not very careful, something will come into your life, dissatisfaction and discontent. With the work you are doing now, with the place you are now, there will be some dissatisfaction because you are living in tomorrow. You are not living in today. You are not living in the responsibility, in the opportunity of today. You are living in the height and in the greatness and in the riches of what your service or your ministry will be tomorrow. Therefore, you are dissatisfied today. And if you are not careful, you will be critical of the church. You will be negative of the church. You will be grumbling. You will be mourning and complaining. You will say, well, I ought to be an evangelist and they just keep me as a food distributor in the church. You have to start somewhere. 
And that is the way the Lord has planned it. That if you are going to be useful in future, the Lord wants you to be faithful in the little thing you are doing now. Because it is your faithfulness, your loyalty, your dependability, your commitment today that will prepare you for a greater opportunity and for a greater service tomorrow. If you are unfaithful today, that thing you are looking for may never come. If you are unloyal, if you are not loyal today, if you are dishonest today, if you are not trustworthy today, if you are not doing what you are fine to do today in the church, faithfully, loyally, with all your strength and all your mind, you may, know, you may see that what you are looking for in the future may never, never, never come. You may even find yourself so dissatisfied, so unhappy, so disappointed because you are not faithful in doing the little you have today that you may even run out of the church and then you ruin your life you ruin your life and the lord will not be able to depend upon you because you are found unfaithful now look at luke chapter 16 verse 10 he that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much he that is faithful in that which is least nothing you are doing today a very small thing, insignificant, inconsequential, at least in your own sight. That thing you are doing today, which doesn't have a great name, a great office, be faithful in it, be faithful in it, be faithful there, because he that is faithful in that which is least is faithful in much. And in verse 12, if ye have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? That is, while you are helping hand in the church, you are not the pastor of the church you are not an evangelist yet you are not a prophet yet you are not a teacher yet you are not an apostle yet maybe you are just a helping hand among the ushers in the choir among the cleaners in the church among the people that are just uh, cooking in the church whatever it is you are doing if, if you are faithful in that which is not your own in that which you have to report to another person you are still responsible to a leader ahead of you right within the church if you are faithful there greater opportunities are coming but if you are not jesus christ himself said who shall give you that which is your own you see jesus gave that parable to teach us this important lesson that if you are faithful today tomorrow you'll be doing something greater if you are faithful and loyal and dependable today you are you are deeply committed in the work of the lord today in the church the lord will be using that and he'll be promoting you to do something greater in the future in matthew chapter 25 matthew chapter 25 verses 28 and 29 take each take therefore the talent from him and give it unto him which has ten talents for unto every one unto every one unto every one that has shall be given and it shall have abundance but from him that has not shall be taken away even that which he has jesus told another parable teaching us the necessity of faithfulness if we're going to get into a larger richer deeper greater higher ministry in the future and it says that now three people were chosen to give us a perfect illustration and one was given five talents another two talents another one talent the one that had five talents was so faithful so loyal so committed so dependable and you know he went out no grumbling no complaining he didn't have a critical attitude he just did what the master wanted him to do and he gained five more as an evidence of his faithfulness and loyalty as as a testimony that he just committed himself to doing what he ought to do the man that had only two talents didn't compare himself with the person having five or having one and he went out too and he worked he worked he worked and he gained two more but the one that had one he was so negative he was so critical he was so dissatisfied that he will never work with a single talent that he was given and you know that he was even critical of the master's attitude of the leader's attitude and he said well i know you to be an austere man you know he called the master the leader an austere man a difficult man a wicked man and he will not do anything at all that's the mark of unfaithfulness that's the mark of not being loyal that's the mark of dishonesty that's the mark of not being dependable 
and that's the mark of not being committed. He buried his talent. He gave me only one. When other people have five, brother, sister, use that one. Use that one. Because there is a principle of use in the very court of heaven. A principle that the Lord Almighty works with. That if you use one, you'll have a greater opportunity. If you are faithful in a little, you'll have what is greater. When you come later, now listen to me, let me help you. I didn't start preaching to 5,000 people. I didn't start preaching to uh, 10,000 people. Far back many years ago, I just started with only five people. Five people. I didn't start preaching to adults. They were just uh, people of secondary school age. And for, for so many weeks, uh, for so many months, for so many years, all the people I had were just small students. Uh, you know where I started teaching the Bible? To primary school children. Who would just like to hear the story about David killing Goliath? Who would like to hear the story about Noah's ark and the, the unbelieving world perishing under the flood? Who would like to hear the story of Jesus being born in a manger? Who would like to hear the story of the angels singing when Jesus Christ was born? That's where I started. But I loved it. I was loyal. I was faithful. I just kept on doing it. I'm talking about 1965, 1966. And I remember writing letters to those small children. When I went to university, I was interested in them. That was all my life. I was, I was so enraptured with the opportunity of sharing the gospel with those children. And when I came out of a university, I didn't start preaching to thousands. I just started again with some secondary school children, just telling them the love of God, the love of God. I didn't know any Greek word, any Hebrew word. I didn't know the whole Bible. I didn't know all the doctrine. If you are in Christ, Jesus will become a new creature. All things will pass away. And behold, all things will become new. And I taught them the little songs I knew. Jesus lost me. This I know for the Bible tells me so. And I told them the little that I knew. And I will travel some miles to go and teach a Bible study of young boys and girls. Just about 22, just about 23. But what the Lord is looking for is not a preaching to five thousand at the beginning just faithfulness just faithfulness that was all and then when i saw that they didn't have bibles i just spend my money and buy little bibles for them bible at that time of 50 cover that's all the money i had and i, and I bought it for them sometimes of one naira sometimes of a five naira just bought it for them just in a little way in a little way and eventually, you know, I came to Lagos. They didn't know me as a preacher in Lagos. My first message I gave publicly in Lagos, they were expecting a great preacher. And I went there to listen to that preacher. And uh, that preacher was saying that he couldn't come. And while they were singing choruses, uh, the leader that planned the meeting just came to me while I was buying my head and he tapped me on the shoulder in 1972. And he said, uh, please, uh, my brother, uh, we're waiting for the preacher and uh, he has not come. Would you mind and go and prepare a message? Well, I didn't say, you saw me here before, you didn't call me. Now you are disappointed, you are calling me, I'm sorry, I can't do it. No, I must be faithful, I must be faithful. And I said, uh, well, uh, when is the message going to start? Well, they said just in about 10 minutes time. And I didn't say, well, you didn't give me enough opportunity to prepare it. I said, that's all right. That's all right. Because all that God needs is just faithfulness, faithfulness in a little sin. And I went out there and the Lord held me and I gave them the message. And the second day they were still expecting the preacher. And the preacher didn't come. And he said, would you mind to continue? I said, that's all right. Faithfulness, commitment, dependability. That is it. And then some people started knowing that I could teach a little. I could teach a little. I could teach a little. And that was all I did. Just teach a little. And then people started coming for counseling. And I said, don't you think it will be wonderful as we are being led of the Lord to start a Bible study of our own in 1973, August? And we started with 15 people and we called it Deeper Christian Life Ministry. I couldn't try to attract. I couldn't prepare a beautiful outline like this. I didn't uh, start preparing Bible study outline with, uh, you know, all these uh, words uh, starting the same way, uh, sounding the same way. I didn't start like that. And, uh, you know, we just started in a little way, very little way, with 15 people. And the little I knew, I taught them. The little I knew, I taught them. But 
you know, that's all that God is looking for. That if you are teaching us fellowship, the little you know, teach it. If you're an usher, if you're a member of the choir, if you're working one way or the other, do it. Now, you know, think about it. That as we're here now, we had the first service. And in the first service, there were very, very many. And, uh, you know, any teacher would have said, I will teach the first class. And then any other person can teach the second. No, I don't do that. If you come to the second uh, Bible study and you are smaller than this, I just put in all my strength, all my effort, and I just still depend upon the Lord and say, God, I want to be faithful. Even if there are not as many as the first uh, Bible study session, just give me the privilege and the opportunity and the anointing to teach them all I know. And you know, I, I don't, uh, when I teach in the second Bible study, I don't say, well, this is a smaller crowd, and just give you less. Sometimes I even give you more. Some things I didn't say in the first, I say it in the second. Even though you are smaller in number, you see, that is faithfulness, that is loyalty, that is commitment, that is dependability. And when you use the opportunity you have, the privilege you have, in any capacity, you are faithful, you are loyal, you are dependable, you are committed, the Lord will give you greater things. Look at First Timothy. First Timothy chapter 3. I'm reading verses 10 and 13. I'm telling you all this so that you will understand that whatever you are doing in the church, be faithful, be faithful. Because, you know, if uh, you are grumbling, criticizing, complaining, if you are negative, you may never go beyond the point where you are now. The Lord may never be able to promote you and give you something greater to be done in future. Be faithful. It's so important. Now, in First Timothy chapter 3, I'm reading verse 10. Let these also first be proved. Then let them use the office of a deacon, being found blameless. Uh, you know, where you are, what you are doing in the church, maybe little, maybe small, maybe unnoticed, may not have a great name attached to it, may not have a great office title attached to it, but you know, you are proving yourself. You are proving whether you are faithful and committed or not. You are proving whether you are loyal or not. Whether you are dependable or not. Now, it says they must first be proved. And after that, they can use the office of a deacon if you have found them blameless. And in verse 13, For they that use the office of a deacon, well, purchase to themselves a good degree. If you use the office of a deacon, well, that's a helping hand in the church. Just an usher in the church. Just uh, leading a house fellowship in the church. If you use that well, you purchase to yourself a good degree, a great opportunity and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. Now it's important that we are found faithful. In Ecclesiastes chapter, te chapter 9 verse 10. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verse 10. Whatsoever thine hand findest to do, do it with all thy might, do it with thy might, for there is no work, no device, no knowledge, no wisdom in the grave, whither thou goest. And um, that's what the Lord is looking for, faithfulness. Whatever you are doing today, faithfulness. I was talking to you yesterday on the Great Commission. And I told you the necessity of doing that work in your neighborhood and telling your neighbor, telling your friend, telling your colleagues in the place of work, telling the people that you meet, strangers and neighbors, telling them God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Have everlasting life. Have everlasting life. And I told you that the Lord gave the word and great was the company of the people that published it. If you are faithful in that as a soul winner, the Lord can lift you up and it can make, he can make you a dynamic minister of the gospel tomorrow, but you'll be faithful today. You tell your neighbors, share your testimony, tell them of the love of God and tell them of the saving, living, life-changing gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, if you are that faithful, a greater thing will be coming your way. A greater thing will be coming your way. 
And let me give you another example in the Old Testament. That man, David, he was a young man. His father had many sons, eight in number, and he was the last. And the other seven were, were staying in the city, and he was just in the, in the, in the, in the bush, watching over the sheep, the animals of the father. The animal did not belong to him just of his father but if you are faithful in that which belongs to another man that will belongs to another leader the lord will give you your own but if you are not faithful in that which belongs to another man who will give you that which is your own he was in the bush and whenever there was a great occasion a great important uh, ceremony they were to have in the city they never called him they never called him you remember when God told Samuel, you go into the house of Jesse and choose me a king over there in the house of Jesse. They didn't call David, but he was faithful, he was loyal, he was dependable, he was committed, he never grumbled, he never compared himself with his elder brothers who were back at home. And whenever they were choosing warriors to go to the battlefield, they never chose David. He was too small. All they wanted him to do was to take care of sheep, of animals at the backside of the desert, just in the forest. And then they will go about finding, finding something to eat for them, finding the water they will drink. Now you think about a man that is relegated to the background like that. If you were, if you were, wouldn't you feel lonely? disappointed discouraged want to feel negative want to be critical want to always be grumbling against the people that put you in that place to take care of the animals there will you be doing your best there but you know if you are faithful if you are faithful god will use the faithfulness of that thing you are doing a little way and then he will promote you to great honor great honor and a great office will be coming your way. Come to 1 Samuel chapter 17. Let me show you this. 1 Samuel chapter 17. Verse 34. And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, his father's sheep, not my own. And there came a lion and a bear, and took a lamp out of the flock. And I went out after him, and smote him, and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by the beard, and smote him, and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he has defied, defied the armies of the living God. David said, Moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion, and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of the Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. That's what he was doing. And you can see he was faithful. You cannot expect a greater commitment from a man, from a young man in the forest, just taking care of sheep. And he never grumbled, he never complained. He was never critical of his father. He was never critical of the elder brothers. He just did what he was told to do in all humility. And he was loyal, faithful, dependable, committed. My question to you is, my brother, my sister, are you like that? Do you have an evidence of faithfulness, an evidence of loyalty? Or are you a grumbling member, a critical member, a negative member? I came before so and so and look at me now I'm not doing much in the church my brother that's not the issue my sister that's not the point not that you came before so and so not that you must be doing much more than so and so forget about so and so forget about such and such are you faithful in the little you are doing David wasn't comparing himself with anybody just be faithful just be loyal just be committed just be dependable. Now, if you're doing what you like, the way you like it, and when you like it, and you're stubborn, and you're rebellious, and hard-hearted, that means you are not faithful. If you're given something to do in the church, no matter how little, and the leadership of the church has told you how to do it, when to do it, and, and the manner in which you must do it, and you go your own way, and you do it your own way, and you are stubborn, and heady, and you are rebellious, and you say, well, I know what to do. Let nobody control me. 
listen to me. You may jeopardize your chance of doing anything greater in the church of God because God is watching you. The eyes of the Almighty God are watching you and is watching for faithfulness. And if you are not, you just block your way to a higher, greater, richer ministry. Philip was a worker in the church and whatever little thing he was told to do in the church, he was faithful and loyal. He was committed and dependable and the Lord was able to make him a dynamic minister, a dynamic and effective evangelist later in life. Now, I told you about David. You see what he was doing? Now, see how God promoted him because of his faithfulness. Now, you know a man had to be faithful when no eyes were watching him except the eyes of God. And he was defending that, the sheep away from the lion, away from the bear. Now, listen to me. If you have only about 50 people to care for, and you are not faithful there, you are not concerned about them, and you are not doing it in the proper way, or even only 20 people in the house fellowship to care for, only about 15 people to care for, but uh, you are not uh, dependable. You are not, uh, you are not really doing it. Uh, you know, uh, there is no way God will promote you. Let me tell you this. 1967. All the people I knew that I had the privilege of ministering to or teaching the gospel, they were all below, the 20, below 20 years of age. And all of them were less than age in number. Age in number. But I so much loved them. I was so much committed to sharing the gospel with them. In fact, almost every week, before I had the opportunity of seeing them face to face, I'd be writing letters to them, asking about their welfare. Every day I was praying for them. Every day I was thinking about them. Not up to eight people. Not, not up to eight people. And all the age, they were less than 20 years of age. But I was committed. I was committed. I was committed. In fact, 1967, when the university called me and said, now you've done so well in the, in the degree exam that now we give you automatic scholarship so that now you will, you will come and study this and study that. You know what I thought of? I thought if I accepted the scholarship, what will happen to the eight people, about eight people that I had to teach the word of God? And I saw that it will separate me from them. And I rejected and I said, no, I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't do it. Because I will be faithful. I will be faithful. And you know, they were surprised. And I went back to that school and I rejected uh, the scholarship. And I was with those people, just small children, just telling them, God loves you. Jesus loves me this. I know for the Bible tells me so. That's all I knew to tell them. And I just told them that they should change their lives and repent of their sins and give their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. Not many, not up to age. Just teaching them faithfulness. I remember 19, uh, 1974, the University of Lagos said they sent me to London, Chelsea College. And over there, the provost of Chelsea College called me and he said, now, we want to give you a scholarship and just remain here for the next three years. And I said, what do you think about it? And I said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I cannot stay in London for three years. Even the two months I was staying there at that time from October to December, went on October 16th and returned around October 16th or 18th. Uh, sorry, December 16th or 18th. The two months I spent there, it was a little bit difficult because there were some people here, Deeper Christian Life Ministry. You know the number then? When I left in October, October 1974, they were just about 144. And by the time I came back, they were not up to that anymore. They were just above 100. And because of those 144 people, I said, no, I cannot stay in London for three years. I have a work to do in Nigeria. Faithfulness, faithfulness and commitment. You know, without that, we will not be having thousands of people we are talking to today. Be faithful. Whatever the Lord has given you to do, don't say it is small. Despise not the days of small things. If it's a little house fellowship, do it. If it's a little group of people that the church has given you responsibility to work, for, to work with, do it. And as you do it, the Lord himself will be promoting you to a greater level of ministration. Now, um, Psalm 78, Psalm 78, verse 70 to verse 72, Psalm 78. He chose David also, his servant, and took him from the sheepfolds, from following Use that is sheep, great with young, 
He brought him to feed Jacob his people and Israel his inheritance. You see how the Lord lifted him up? How the Lord removed him from taking care of the sheep to taking care of the whole of the nation? So he fed them according to the integrity of his heart and guided them by the skillfulness of his hands. That's the point I've been telling you. The Lord wants us to be faithful. The Lord wants us to be faithful. And whatever you are doing, it may be a small thing, it may be little in your sight, inconsequential in your sight. Do it. Do it with all your strength. Do it with all the ability that is within you. Don't grumble. Don't be negative. Don't be critical. Do it with the joy of the Lord. Do it with faith. Do it with a great commitment. And be happy while you are doing it. Singing on your way while you are doing it. And the Lord will be preparing you for a greater ministry ahead. Now, on our outline, we have um, the magnanimity of Philip, the message of Philip, and the ministration of Philip. But I'm deviating a little from what I've written there. I'm not going to talk today on the magnanimity, the message, and the ministration. I'll be doing that later. But now, I just want to expose you to what we call the ministry of an evangelist. Because I see that in the church world, in many places, we do not really and fully understand the ministry of an evangelist. Who is an evangelist? What does an evangelist do? Where does an evangelist minister? How does an evangelist minister? And what is the impact and the result and the influence of the ministry of an evangelist? So let me just tell you, the purpose, the productivity, the power, the parenthood, the partnership in the ministry of an evangelist. The purpose, the productivity, the power, the parenthood, the partnership in the ministry of an evangelist. You need all this to be able to understand what an evangelist does, who an evangelist is, and what qualifies a person for an evangelist, and how does he minister. Now, we've seen it in um, the life of Philip. I told you in this message that is the only one that has a record of the activities of an evangelist attached unto his ministry. He is particularly labeled and called an evangelist. Look at Acts chapter 8 again. Verse 5. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. He preached Christ unto them. He preached Christ unto them. That is the purpose of the ministry of an evangelist. The purpose of ministry for an evangelist. He preached Christ unto them. Look at verse 12. But when they believed, they believed Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. That is the ministry of an evangelist. Preaching, preaching, preaching Jesus Christ. The gospel of the Lord. In verse 35, then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and he preached unto him Jesus. Now you can see that an evangelist is somebody that is an announcer of good news. A proclaimer of good tidings. Taking the gospel message, the love of God from place to place. In Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40 verse 9 O Zion that bringeth good tidings get thee up into the high mountain O Jerusalem that bringeth good tidings lift up thy voice with strength lift it up be not afraid and say unto the cities of Judah behold your God. That's the purpose of ministry for an evangelist. He bringeth good tidings. And he comes up on a high platform. And then he lifts up his voice with strength. He lifts it up without any fear, without any compromise. And he says to the cities where he will be holding his crusades, his public ministry, he'll be saying to those cities, Behold your God. Behold your God 
who can save. Behold your God who can deliver. Behold your God who can heal. Behold your God who so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's the purpose of the evangelist. He's calling the people in the cities and the villages all over in whatever country or continent to tell the people to behold the God who saves, who heals, who delivers. In Isaiah chapter 52, reading verse 7, Isaiah chapter 52, verse 7. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publishes peace, that bringeth good tidings of good, that publishes salvation, that says unto Zion, Thy God reigneth. That's the evangelist. That's the evangelist. He comes into the city. He comes into Zion or Jerusalem or Samaria or any other city in the world. And he tells the people that he has come to tell them about the Prince of Peace. He publishes peace. He has come to tell them the way of salvation. He publishes, publishes salvation. He has come to tell them that God reigneth. And that God, his power will reign because he is the God that has authority. The God that has all power, both in heaven and on earth. And there will be nothing that will be able to raise its ugly head when that God is reigning in his manifestation. And it's, he says to the people that the life of Christ can reign in them. They can be born again. They can be saved. Because he comes to publish both peace and salvation. The purpose of ministry for an evangelist is publishing the glad tidings, the good news. In Luke chapter 4, verse 18, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. That's the evangelist, having the Spirit upon him. You know, Jesus Christ ministered in all these offices. He was an apostle, he was a prophet, he was an evangelist, he was a great and a good and a chief shepherd, the pastor, and he was a teacher that has come from God. And beyond that, the Savior, the Christ, the Messiah. And um, he saved, he healed the sick, he taught, he built the church upon this rock. I build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. He stood in all those ministries. And in fact, the fullness of the manifestation of the power of any of these services, they all come together in the life of Jesus Christ. And so the evangelist has the spirit of the Lord upon him. Because he has been anointed to preach the gospel to the poor. He has been sent to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and the recovering of sight to the blind, and to set at, to set at liberty them that are bruised, and to proclaim, to announce the acceptable deliverance year of the Lord, the year of Jubilee. Now you can see then the purpose of ministry for the evangelist. What's the productivity? In Acts of the Apostles chapter 8, Verse 6, Acts chapter 8, verse 6. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. Many converts were won, many souls were saved, and then there were miracles that took place. In verse 7, for unclean spirits crying with loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies and that were lame were healed, and there was great joy in that city. That's the productivity in the ministry of an evangelist. Salvation to the lost, to the sinners, many, many people coming to the Lord, excited and happy and joyful of the joy of salvation. And they will sing because of the joy of the Lord in their hearts. Having believed on the Lord, they were justified by faith. And the peace of God came to settle in their hearts. And they were given rest. Come unto me, ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And it is the evangelist inviting them to that. Telling them, look unto me, says the Lord, all ye the ends of the earth. And be ye say, because this is the God and there is none else beside him. And uh, when, they, when they receive that message, there is productivity. They are saved, they are healed, and they are delivered. In verse 12, Acts 8 verse 12. But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized both men 
and women. Now, what's the power in ministry? You've seen the purpose to proclaim the gospel, the gospel of peace and of salvation, of the grace of God. You've seen the productivity, soul saved, the sick healed, and those who are oppressed and tormented and possessed by the devil, all getting delivered. What's the power? Is the power of the Holy Ghost. Because we're told in chapter 6, the very qualification, the things that qualified Philip to be chosen, to even be the worker in the church in the first place, it was the power of the Holy Ghost. Acts 6, verse 3 and verse 5. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip. So then the power is the power of the Holy Ghost. The power to announce the Messiah, the Christ. The power to publish the good tidings. The power to tell of the saving grace of the Lord. Now, let me tell you about parenthood of the minister. This is a soft point, a solemn area, an important area, an area where many so-called evangelists have been negligent and careless. Now, there are evangelists who are dynamic outside, but they are just failures inside their home. They do not know what to do with their wives, with their children. They are able to win souls. They are able to preach the gospel and they go from city to city, from village to village. But then you ask about their wives, they are nowhere to be found. You ask about their children, their children do not have the benefit of the gospel they are preaching. But Philip, the only recorded example and the only record that is given to us as an example, as a beacon of an evangelist. We are told about his parent, parenthood. That is, he was a father at home. Now, in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 21, verse 8 and verse 9 and verse 10. And the next day, we that were of Paul's company departed and came unto Caesarea. And we entered into the house of Philip the Evangelist, into the house of Philip the Evangelist, which was one of the seven, and abode with him. And the same man had four daughters, virgins, virgins, which did prophesy. They had a ministry in the church. Now, look up here. Uh, you find out about evangelists who are living today. Well, not all of them are really Bible evangelists, New Testament evangelists, because there are people that just like the title evangelist, and they don't know what it all means. They don't know what it is all about. And uh, they, they just use the title evangelist. But then, in the New Testament, you see in the ministry of an evangelist, the announcer of good news, the proclaimer of good tidings, the messenger of the gospel of Jesus Christ, taking that gospel from place to place. And you've seen the purpose, the productivity, and the power of the ministry of the evangelist. Now, the parenthood. Now, this evangelist, we're told, had authority in his own house. He was a father at home. A father of four children. Those four children were girls. They grew up to be ladies. And they were all virgins. Think about it. They were not wayward. They were not worldly. It wasn't by force he did it. It was by love. He knew what it meant to be a preacher. And he knew what it meant to be a father. He knew about love. He knew about training the children. He knew about just getting those children together, teaching them Bible stories. He wasn't too busy outside and then neglecting the home. He had four daughters and they were all virgins and they did prophesy. They had a ministry of prophecy and they were even going beyond their father because if they continued like that, they would just be in the, in the ministry and the office of prophets in the church. And then it says in verse 10, And we tarried there many days. We tarried there many days. Now, I'm a, I'm a preacher. Let me tell you this. I travel around sometimes. And uh, when you travel around and you are living in a particular home, in a particular house, 
if there is hostility in that house, hatred in that house, noise in that house, disagreements in that house, fighting in that house, you will not be able to prepare the message you are going to give in the evening. And, but you know, all the apostles, a preacher, and all the other apostles, all the other preachers that came to the house of Philip, they didn't find hostility there. They just stayed there many, many days. And out of that house, they were reaching out to preach the gospel. And we're told in verse 10, there came down from Judea a certain prophet named Agabus. And Agabus the prophet came into that house again. A house where an apostle can live and feel convenient. A prophet can come and feel convenient. And other preachers of the gospel can come and feel convenient. There is no hostility there. There is hospitality there. Now, when you are a preacher of the gospel, when you are an evangelist, if you are a Bible-based evangelist, you are a person that has hospitality at all. Not only hospitality, spirituality. Spirituality. And you can see that in the whole, because those daughters were spiritual. You never heard a worldly song in the house, a corrupt language in the house. All those daughters were just virgins, beautiful, saintly, spiritual, prophetic and bible based and scriptural their comportment never tempted any of the leaders any of the workers that came to live in that house their comportment just made everybody move forward and that was because of the parenthood in the ministry of philip now our evangelists today are they like that evangelists in this nation in this country in this continent of africa all over the world evangelists do they take care of their wives? Are the wives happy at home? Are the children growing up to have the gifts that they ought to have in being useful in the church? Now, Philip has given us an example. We've seen the purpose, the productivity, the power, the parenthood in his ministry. Now, we also want to see the partnership. This is just beautiful, beautiful. Because this Philip, he was in close link with the church. There are many evangelists today who just like to have an independent, autonomous, evangelistic ministry. They do not want to have any connection with a Bible-based church, teaching the whole doctrine of the Bible. They like to just do whatever they like, a king in their empire. They do not like anybody to see the doctrine they preach or to control anything they're doing. They, whenever they wanted to collect money, they wanted all the money they could collect without being accountable to anybody. But you know, it wasn't like that in the Bible. Come back to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. Reading from verse 14. Now when the apostles which were Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of the Lord, they sent unto them Peter and John. Now, Philip sent back to the headquarters church. And he said, this is what we're doing here. This is the stage it had gone. He had a link. A close link with the headquarters church. That's a real Bible-based evangelist. And uh, you know in this church, we just follow the Bible. And I've just told you now uh, that uh, if you are not faithful in the little you are doing, and you feel that you want to be an evangelist, and you give yourself the label, and you're reaching out on your own, and you don't have any contact with the headquarters church, you will not be a New Testament evangelist. All you will do when you need co cooperating churches is to make an announcement in some area where you go and you get all the white garment churches, all the candle burning churches, all the incense burning churches, all the, uh, rolling, all the rolling members of the occultic churches rolling on the ground, drinking water, holy water. You'll get them together and say, let's cooperate together. We are the church together. Let's have a crusade. That's what you'll do. That's what you'll do. Because you don't have a link with a Bible-based church, You'll have to get all the people that believe different things, different things, different things. Call them together to support you, to plan the crusade, and to give the money, to give everything that has to be given. And now Philip did not do that. He had a link of the Jerusalem church that was teaching all the doctrines of the Bible. And when the revival was going on, when the crusade was going on, after the Lord had given him such a great productivity and result of the preaching of the gospel in Samaria, the people in Jerusalem heard and they sent Peter and John. He had partnership, partnership with those that knew better. In verse 15, who when they were come down prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet, 
he was falling upon none of them only the only they were baptized in the name of the lord jesus then they laid their hands on them and they received the holy ghost now philip couldn't do that philip couldn't do that he was only an evangelist he couldn't teach the deeper doctrines of the bible on sanctification on the baptism in the holy spirit he couldn't minister it he knew about it he himself had got it but then he couldn't minister it but because he had the background and the link of the church at jerusalem Peter and John came and they ministered to those people and they received the Holy Ghost. Not only that, we're told in verse 18, when Simon saw that through the laying on of the hands of the apostles' hands, the, ho the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay, I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. Now, this Simon had professed salvation, Listen to me very well. He had said, well, I'm born again, I'm born again. And Philip had baptized him in water. Before this time, he was a sorcerer. A sorcerer. Now, that means he was a witch. In fact, the Bible says so in verse 9. But there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria. Bewitched the people of Samaria giving out that he himself was some great one, to whom they all gave heed from the least, even to the greatest, saying, This man is a great power of God. And to him they had regard because of that, that of a long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God, the same and the name of Jesus, they were baptized both men and women. Then Simon himself believed also. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and the signs which were done. He was already very close to Philip. Listen to me, evangelist. You know, an evangelist that does not have discernment, discernment, the discerning of spirits in the fullest measure. Now, Philip had a little of discerning of spirits because he knew the activities of evil spirits. He knew the um, power of all the civil spirits and he knew that the power of the Holy Ghost will be able to drive them out. Because we are told in verse 7, for unclean spirits crying out with loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them and many that were taken with palsies and that were lame were healed. He had that power. But then in the case of Simon, he did not have the proper discerning of spirits. To discern that his heart was not right. Uh, you know, if he continued like that, when uh, Simon would see that he had not got everything he wanted, he could go back into sorcery, he could go back into bewitching the people and even destroying a part of the work that was done already. That's why you, you shouldn't be an isolated minister, an isolated worker. Uh, be surrounded by other ministries and other ministers, apostle, prophet, pastor and teacher, supporting you and you remain in the church as well as well reaching out and launching out. Now, uh, I'll still be teaching on the evangelist uh, next week. And uh, the following weeks, I'm teaching a series on casting out devils on the basis of verses 6 and 7. I want to teach a series on uh, having power over witches and wizards in the Monday Bible study here. Because now, in this church, I want you to know all that you ought to know. In the Old Testament, they couldn't deal with witches and wizards. And all the did was to just turn them and kill them. If anybody had familiar spirit in the Old Testament, because they didn't have that power to cast out and to destroy all the powers of the evil spirits, all they could do was just to stun them. But in the New Testament, we bind and loose. We cast out those devils in the name of Jesus. We don't kill the witches now. We just make them powerless. And we just destroy the, wo the works of the devil. And uh, after next week, I'm starting a series on how the believer has will have the authority and the power to be able to cast out those evil spirits. Now, let's come back to Philip the Evangelist. He was in partnership with the apostles and the preachers in Jerusalem. And when they came, now Simon the sorcerer said, uh, well, give me this power. So that upon whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. Now in verse 20, but Peter said unto him, thy money perish with thee. Because thou hast thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. 
that thou might attack my lot in this matter. For thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Who could say that but an apostle? An apostle. With the authority of an apostle. Very emphatic, very sure, uncertain of what you are saying. He said, You have neither lot or, or, or neither lot or right in, in this matter. And then he said, Your heart is not right in the sight of God. Now wait, Peter, Philip has baptized him in water. Well, don't worry about that. He has been following Philip about, don't worry about, don't worry about that. His heart was not right with God, and he took a person who was greater than Philip the evangelist to be able to detect it and to say it out. And then in verse 22, repent therefore of this, thy wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee, for I perceive that thou art in the God of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity, a terrible condition. Then answered Simon and said, Pray ye to the Lord for me, that none of these things which ye have spoken come upon me. Now, it was the partnership that this evangelist had with the headquarters church that rescued him from untold embarrassment from Simon, the sorcerer. And I will tell you today, I will introduce you to the ministry of an evangelist. And you've seen the purpose, the productivity, the power, the parental, the partnership in the ministry of an evangelist. Now, the Lord may not be choosing you as an evangelist because not everybody will be evangelist. We all be serving us, witnessing and talking to people about the Lord Jesus Christ. But then the Bible says he gave some apostles, not everybody, some apostles. He gave some prophets, not everybody, some prophets. And he gave some evangelists, not everybody, not everybody, some evangelists and some pastors, not everybody, and some teachers. Everybody will witness, everybody will share the gospel, everybody will talk one to one with a neighbor, with a friend, with a colleague in the place of work. If God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believers will not perish, but have everlasting life. For, the, for God did not send his son to condemn, but to save the world. And so we will go and witness and testify that Jesus, Jesus is the Savior of the whole world. Everybody will witness and testify and bring people to the Lord, but not everybody is an evangelist. Now, you will need to determine what ministry the Lord wants you to have. But whatever that ministry may be, the Lord has taught us something today. Be faithful. Be faithful. Be faithful. If you are not, it will tell in eternity. If you are not here in this world, you will not be ushered into that greater, richer, higher, deeper ministry you are looking for. You may never get it. You may wait indefinitely. The only way you can get into a greater ministry that the Lord may prepare you for is be faithful today. Be dependable. Be committed. Be loyal. Whatever your hand finds to do today, do it with all thy mind. As you do that, the Lord will be unfolding his plan and purpose for you, step by step, as the days come and go. Rise up and let us pray. Commit yourself to the Lord. Be faithful. Be loyal. Be dependable. Be committed. If you are not, you have a great thing to lose. It may be to five people you are ministering, be faithful. It may be to twelve people you are ministering in the house fellowship, be faithful. It may be just the opportunity to share your testimony and give the gospel message to a neighbor, to a friend, to a colleague in the place of work, be faithful. It may be that you are singing in the choir, be faithful. It may be just officiating as an usher, be faithful. It may be that you are a visitation leader, be faithful. Because as you are faithful and committed and dependable and loyal, you are preparing for a greater ministry ahead of you. Be faithful. Tumble. Don't complain. Don't be critical of the leadership in the church. Be faithful. Be loyal. Be dependable. Be committed. 